So a great big welcome to uh, to all this day as we gather and this the 20th Sunday of Pentecost. And we hope you're doing fine. I know for many of you, you're sitting at home probably in your jammies and your sip of your coffee. And we're just glad to have you with us. So welcome. And also for uh, those that are in the sanctuary, welcome them as well. Uh, a little bit about today, the uh, I'm dealing with the epistle lesson. It's in Hebrews, kind of a favorite passage of mine. There's some powerful words in there. It talks about the word of God being active and living, like a two-edged sword. Sword that uh, uh, cuts into the, the, the very innards of ourselves, uh, reveals that we are sinful, we are imperfect uh, creatures, and that God sees all that. And yet to know that God loves us and accepts us and is with us is, is so important. The most important thing to know that God does see us. Uh, even when we think we're not being seen, even when we think that he's not with us, he's with us every step of the way. And so I hope uh, I hope the message and the service today, the music, uh, is uh, um, an encouragement and a help for you in your Christian journey. Uh, we're again just glad to have you on board. And so uh, let me begin the service today uh, with the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And let me continue with the prayer of the day. And so to you, almighty and ever-living God, increase in us your gift of faith, that forsaking what lies behind and reaching out to what lies ahead, we may follow the way of your commandments and receive the crown of everlasting joy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God bless you. And I'll turn the service over to our music team as they share their gifts of music. God bless. Our epistle lesson for today is from the fourth chapter of the book of Hebrews, beginning with verse 12. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It's able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him, no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, and yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This ends the reading. And 
Our gospel lesson for this, the 20th Sunday after Pentecost, is from the 10th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, beginning with verse 17. As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who could be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. And so grace and peace to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. And so let us pray. Lord, we thank you again as we gather this day as your people. Yes, some still in their respective homes and, and some within the sanctuary. But Lord, together we are your church. O oh Lord, come. Come and fill now the hearts and lives of your people. I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleased in your sight. And this I pray. Amen. The dean at Princeton Theological Seminary tells of being in the lunch line at the school's cafeteria one day. And he sees a bowl of big juicy oranges. Well, the chef had placed a sign beside the bowl that read, Take only one. God is watching you. Well, at the other end of the lunch line, there was a large plate of freshly baked cookies. Beside it was a hastily scrawled sign that some seminarian had written that said, Take as many cookies as you want. God is back there watching the oranges. <laughs> I think what makes the story humorous is, uh, is that it assigns human limitations to God, who, as we know in reality, God's not limited. It implies that God cannot see what's going on in more than one place at a time. Hello? Is that the God you know of? No. I especially like this story for having been educated myself in a seminary. I recognize a good-natured irreverence in the seminary and sign, which is really saying if you believe God's sight is limited to only one place, your idea of God is way too small. Actually, when I was in seminary, one of the words we used to describe God was omniscient, which literally means seeing everything. That is, uh, that is what the verses from our epistle lesson, which is from one of my favorite passages in Hebrew, it's in chapter 4. What, that's what it's all about. For the first verse talks about the word of God being alive and active. And here refers to the entire scope of God's revelation to us, which includes the scriptures, includes Jesus, and every other way in which God has spoken and revealed himself to us. That word, Hebrews, says is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing our innermost being meaning that there is no part of us that God does not see. Second verse is even more explicit about God's all-seeing ability. It tells us that before God, no creature is hidden, but all are naked and all are laid bare to the eyes of one to whom we must render an account. Wow. That means at that time you ignored someone in need. God saw it, and God knows all about it. That nasty thought that passed through your mind the other day, God knows about that too. The little thing you did some time ago that you didn't want anyone to know about, yep, God even knows about that too. It's clearly discomforting to think that nothing, absolutely nothing, is hidden from God. 
For even the best of us fails sometimes, pastors included. So some of what God sees in any of us surely tells them that, let's just say, yeah, we don't always hit the mark, do we? But note that the all-seeing word of God is a two-edged sword. And that means that it cuts both ways. Well, on the one hand, there may be some shame or even worry in our part, knowing that God knows all about us. On the other hand, there can be great comfort in knowing that we are seen by the all-powerful God of the entire universe. The second edge of the sword is illustrated by that Old Testament story of Hagar. You may remember that story. Hagar was an Egyptian slave girl that was serving the family of Abraham. When her mistress Sarah bore no children, Sarah urged Abraham to father a child with Hagar, which he did. But after Hagar became pregnant, she got so haughty about it that in response, Sarah dealt very harshly with her that Hagar ran away into the wilderness. There beside an old well, God came to Hagar, promised that she would give birth to a son who would be the father of a nation, and told her to return to Sarah. Hagar took great comfort in this fact that God saw her exactly where she was. We know this because she responded by calling God el ro I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, which means God who sees me. What a relief it must have been for her to realize that even where she was, a pregnant woman alone in a wild place, that she was not out of the sight of God. Later, the well where this encounter between God and Hagar took place came to be known as the Berla Hairoi, which means the well of the living one who sees me. You see, when we say that God is omniscient, we're not talking about the cold eye of some cosmic scorekeeper who's tracking every sin and misstep that we commit. We're being viewed by our creator, the one who loves us and who wants us to succeed in being the people of God. God didn't come to Hagar because she'd been so good and so perfect, far from it. No, once she was pregnant, she became contemptuous about it, flinging the fact of her pregnancy in the face of poor Sarah, who could not get pregnant at that time. But that shows us that our sins and our shortcomings and even our insecurities does not prevent God from reaching out to each of us. God saw Hagar's arrogance and came to her anyway. Likewise, God sees our misdeeds. And believe it or not, God still reaches out to each and every one of us. The chaplain of a hospital unit for people struggling with substance abuse, he tells us something about what it means to be seen by God. In this unit, people usually stay between 14 and 28 days. Well, on one day during each treatment term, the chaplain would come and talk to the patients about spirituality. He says that the one thing that always impressed him was the hunger of the people to hear what he had to say. For the most part, these were people who no longer had any church connections, if they ever had any. Some had done appalling things. In their addictions, they had lied to their employers, stolen from their friends, broken up their families, ruined their relationships, squandered their material goods, and some had even committed some significant crimes. When they thought about God seeing them, many felt horrendous shame and self-contempt. But in conversations with these people, it struck the chaplain again and again that they were more open to God than members of many congregations. Wow. Author Philip Yancey has observed that the church says that when we sin, or some people call it backslide, we disrupt our relationship with God. So we asked a friend who works in an inner city ministry, dealing with people who fail every day. He asked him this question. He said, have you found that backsliding draws people further from God or presses them towards God? The friend said that it pushes them towards God. He explained that some drug addicts are more likely to cry out to God when they are once again losing the battle with drugs than when they are succeeding. Because they do, through the grace of God, some of them get up and are able to try again. In fact, the friend said, I've decided that there's one key in determining whether individual drug addicts can be cured. And that is if they deeply believe that they are a forgivable child of God. Not a failure-free child of God, but a forgivable child of God. So folks, whether we like it or not, we need to know that God sees each and every one of us. And I guess if you're someone who has absolutely no intention of trying to do the right thing, if you are all for yourself and have no thought for others, then the words, God sees me, are probably a reason for worry and concern. But if you're a person who is trying to be open to God, 
even if you don't always succeed, even if you fail miserably most of the time, then the fact that God sees you can be, so to speak, a ladder up with which you can climb towards him, but more importantly, a ladder in which his grace comes down to you. And think about this. Suppose you were to start each day with the thought, hmm, God sees me today. And then you tried to carry that thought with you throughout your activities. Might you not live differently? Might there not be some things that you would change or maybe just put a little more effort into? Might not some member of your family be just a little bit more blessed because of being in contact with you? And also, if you found yourself in sudden danger or on the receiving end of a poor medical prognosis, might it not be a source of courage to remind yourself that God sees you, that God knows what you're going through, and that God is with you every step of the way? I'm not posing all of this hypothetically, for it is a reality. The writer of Hebrews says flat out that the Word of God is living and active. So it's in operation right now. You are seen and loved. You are seen and forgiven. You are seen and given grace and courage. And so people of God know that God sees us. And we as a people are eternally grateful. I pray we never ever forget. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come.
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And so we come to that part of the service that we are calling Spiritual Communion. We miss the comfort of Jesus the Christ, Lord and Savior, brother and companion, who comes to us in, with, and under the forms of bread and wine during communion. From the depths of the reality of heaven, we are loved. So spiritual communion is a trust and an awareness, a prayer and an acceptance. And God's love is really present, even when we can only be as present as our screens allow. I believe God's grace can work through and transcend electronic communication. Through our spiritual communion, the reality of Jesus and the Father's love in and through the Holy Spirit is operating and present in our hearts and in our minds. And so let us pray. I believe that you are truly present in the sacrament of Holy Communion. Lord, I love you above all things. And I long for you in my soul. Since I cannot receive you in the sacrament of your body and blood, come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, and let me never be separated from you. O Lord, may I live in you, and you in me, in this life and in the life to come. And all God's people said, Amen. And so again, we want to thank you for joining us this day. We hope this service today has been helpful in your Christian journey. Please know our love and prayers are with each and every one of you. And again, if we can ever be of any help, uh, do, do not hesitate to call us or email us at the church office. And so receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you.